Glory to God. God. He is capable of fixing it. Amen. Amen. We are believers and our faith and our trust is in God. And we Amen. believe the things we Amen. sing. I know the Lord will fix yes, it. Yes, he will. I know he will fix it. If Glory God alone God. is the one you are looking to, he will certainly fix it. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I need the oh, I need thee. You're the God that is always there. And as we cry out to you, I need thee. 
Your word says the righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of it all. God, we bring every burden. We bring every need, every bill, every financial obligation. We bring you the troubles in the home, the problems on the job. We bring to you, mighty God, the assault of the kingdom of darkness because we wouldn't bend and bow Father, We need you today to come as you saw the affliction of the Israel lights in Egypt and you said to Moses I've seen their tears I've heard their cries and I've come down to deliver this morning God come down in Fen Manhattan today those that are lying come down in our homes come down in our jobs come down in our bodies the affliction the diabetes the cholesterol the high blood pressure the eye problem the back problems the female problems the prostate problems all kinds of things that are happening father our children have gone around grown and, and those that are growing up father you name it it is happening in the earth and it is happening to your people uh, but we have a God that is touched with the feelings uh, of our infirmities hallelujah we have a God that is relevant and is in touch uh, and it is you we come to God the burden bearer the problem solver the way maker our helper in the time of trouble for you are our rock and our salvation. You are our helper and our anchor. Hallelujah. You are our God and there's nothing, absolutely nothing too hard for you to do. And so the eyes of all look to you today, God. We look to you. We look to you. You are our therapist. You are our financier. You are our healer, our deliverer, our counselor. You are our great physician. You are the bomb in Gilead. You are the good Samaritan. You're the God that calls the widows all to multiply and the death was paid in full. You're the God that multiplied the meal and the oil. And three people ate for three and a half years, three square meals a day. You are still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I thank you today, God, as you walk up and down through them, uh, what you are doing for the men and the women uh, that are standing here today looking to you, Father. Their hope is in you. Their expectation is in you. Father, we read the scripture this morning. It tells us that Abraham believed the word of God to him. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed that his barren wife would bear him the son of the promise. Abraham believed that his descendants would be innumerable. And today, God, each of us believe. You've got to believe the word that God has given to you. You've got to believe Jeremiah 29, 11. You play a part in the miracle. You play a part in the reality of your deliverance. You've got to believe God. Hallelujah. Whatever prophetic word he's given to you by his spirit or by a man or woman of God. Whatever scripture God has spoken to you through. You've got to believe it. I believe the word of the Lord. I believe the promise of the Lord. I believe the word of God for fed me shall not die. But we will live to declare the word of the Lord from this side of the vineyard. I believe that God is a God of deliverances. I believe that he's a wonder working, miracle working God. I believe that he's a resurrection and a life. I believe that dead bones can live. I believe that water can come from a rock. Are you believing today, saints? Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Don't be disappointed. Do you believe? I read that scripture yesterday and finally it dawned on me, to me at this time, that God wasn't talking about salvation. He was talking about Abraham believed. He left earth, the Chaldees, to follow God. And because he believed it was reckoned to him, which is an accounted term, that God was going to bless and reward him for believing. Do you believe today? Come on, saints. If you believe God, there has to be a shelter. There must be a shift in the atmosphere. There must be a move of God. Do you believe God today that He can credit them at your account with a blessing of miracle? Like the psalm we would sing today, today, today. God is 
going to do something. Today, 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 God is going to do something. What does God promise you? What does God promise you? Are you going to believe? Or are you going to doubt? It might have been long. It might have been long for 25 years. I've been standing on the promise of the Lord. And it will be for me just like the Lord said it will be. But I believe this morning that before I preach the pastors, that there's a burden in this house. There's a heaviness in this house. And God wants to minister into your trial. God wants to minister into your testing and he's saying to you today believe me like Abraham believe and something will happen at the appointed time. Oh God we cast all the care upon you we cast all the care upon you we cast all the burdens, all the disappointment what is it that you want the Lord to do for you? There are times Jesus asked people that question, even though he knew specifically what they were going through. And he asked, what do you want me to do for you? And one man said that I might receive my sight, glory be to Jesus. He's asking the question this morning, what do you want me to do for you? Glory to God. Hallelujah. What do you want God to do for you this morning? What do you want God to do for you this morning? The Spirit of the Lord is here. What do you want God to do for you this morning? Uh, open up your mouth and tell God what you want Him to do for you. It is not the will of God for you to leave this church burden. It is not the will of God for you to leave heavy. The church is the hospital. The doctors in the house. Uh, the nurses at the, the, the station call upon the name of the Lord today and tell God what you want him to do for you. Cast the care. Hallelujah. When David was dying in his last will and testament, he said to his family and he said to the leaders, hallelujah, who served him in the kingdom, he said, God is my rock. God is my rock. He's my strength. God is my army he and my power. And he is the one that makes my way perfect. Whatever obstacle is in your way this morning, God is able to remove it. Whatever law, whatever statute, whatever the judge has said, whatever the district attorney has said, whatever law, whatever it is, whatever problem, whatever great law, whatever it is, God is here to make your way perfect. Reach out and touch the Lord. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Did you mean it when you sang it? I need thee. When you call God, He has come, He has come. Recall of Oshandara Messiah. Come on and receive of this anointing. Receive of this anointing. God is moving. Receive of this anointing. Why so downcast, oh, my soul? Put your trust in God. Put your hope in God. God says, put your trust in me and you will see great and mighty things. Thank you. Lord, I stand in the gap. I stand in the gap this morning as an Ezekiel intercessor. I stand in the gap for you. I stand in the gap, household by household. And I petition God in your behalf. Hallelujah. Nobody can tell it like you tell it. I don't know how heavy your burden. I don't know how dark your night is. I don't know how flat your valley is. I don't know how long that you've been walking this journey. But God has come today to help. God has come today to strengthen. God has come today, hallelujah, to minister to you. And all he's saying to you is to believe my word. Believe my word. I want to debit your account today, my God. Have mercy, hallelujah. When we were doing the offering, uh, we put the zeal up there uh, that the account can be debited with money. Uh, hey, your faith will release something hey, in your account. Uh, are you hearing me today by the Spirit of God? Your faith uh, is going to release something into your account. Uh, when the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment, uh, something was released. Uh, Jesus said, uh, Virtue just left me. Uh, a demand was made upon my anointing to do so. 
something. Just two more minutes. Just two more minutes. Hallelujah. Believe God today and let something be debited to your account. Believe God today and let there be blessing. Believe God today and let your heart be flooded with joy in the name of Jesus Christ. Believe God today and let the peace of God that pass of all understanding. Let it flood your heart and your life. What is impossible with you is possible with God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still works miracles. He is still in the blessing business. He's alive and well. All over fentanyl. All over fentanyl. Every man and every woman. Whatever your need, whatever your care, whatever your burden, whatever death in the family, whatever family problem, whatever legal problem, whatever problems on the job, whatever medical problem, God says, put your faith in me today, and I'm going to put something in your account. Because whenever God sees faith, uh, he reckons it as righteousness. Uh, it's an accounting term, an all accounting term, where God does something because of your faith. Father, we believe today. I believe that there will be changes in marriages. I believe that God is going to release us from debt. I believe that God is going to provide the money that you need. I believe that God is going to prosper your business. I believe that God will cause the enemy to treat you well in the time of adversity and in the time of affliction. I believe that the enemy will become your footstool. I believe God today is rebuking demons and devils that have been sent to frustrate his purpose for your life. I believe today, hallelujah, the scripture that says that morning by morning, new mercies you will see great as God's faithfulness. I believe. I believe with you. I stand in the gap with you. The spirit of heaviness, the spirit of depression, the spirit of weightiness, the spirit of disappointment, and the spirit has to leave now in the name of Jesus Christ. It has to leave now because the spirit of God is present to bring deliverance. The anointing that destroys the yoke is I thank you, God, that your people are not sad and weak. They're not afraid. They're not disappointed. They're not doubtful. But we believe today. We believe today that God will do it. We believe today that God will do it. From the front of the church to the back. Somebody praise God. Somebody tell God thank you. Somebody praise God. church stands on the word of God. We don't play gimmicks in this house. We what a God, what a God, what a God, what a God. I believe the report of the Lord. I believe the report of the Lord. It will be for me just like the Lord said it will be. I believe I'm down now. I believe and doubt Thank not. You. If you believe uh, that you, Moses Jesus. lifted up his hands and the Thank waters and the Red Sea were parted, why can't you believe that God will work a miracle for you today? My God of mercy. If you believe that the Shulamite woman, that Elisha laid on top of that child uh, and he came back to life, if you believe that, why can't you believe uh, that whatever seemed to be dead in your life, that God uh, will bring it back to life in the name of Jesus Christ? Uh, if you believe that the woman found the lost coin, uh, why can't you believe that whatever is lost of God can find it uh, and bring it back in the name of Jesus? Uh, if you believe that the prodigal boy returned home, uh, why can't you believe that every prodigal son, uh, every prodigal daughter, every prodigal grandchild, uh, every prodigal son-in-law and daughter-in-law will come home? Glory be to Jesus. 
If you believe that the unjust judge gave the middle woman justice, why can't you believe today that God will give you justice? For he's the judge of the whole earth. Why can't you believe? We have more than the urine and the famine today that the ancient Israelites have. We've got the spirit of the living God. My God of mercy, uh, we're not bowing down to the sun or the moon. Uh, we're not using uh, all of those stones that people say have energy uh, to reach uh, some God. We're not using yoga today, uh, but we serve a risen Savior that is in the world today. Hallelujah. A God who loves us, uh, who promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. I declare today, it doesn't matter how dark your night is. Uh, God is in it with you, hallelujah. God is in it with you. Whatever pain you are feeling, hallelujah. He is the pain bearer. He is still healer. Glory be to Jesus. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. My God. I wish some of you would just reach out and tap into this anointing. God has come to lift the burden. God has come to lift the gear. God has come to give you joy and strength. God has come to assure you it doesn't matter what the trial is. I am with you. Hallelujah. Like Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He said, when you pray to the Father, tell him, lead us not into temptation uh, and deliver us from evil. Uh, Jesus used the Greek word by asthma, which means uh, ask the Father not to allow anything that you can't bear to come upon you. Uh, and whatever is upon you today that seems uh, that you want to suck the spiritual life out of you. Uh, the life of the Spirit is here today. Uh, come on and live. Come on and live in the Spirit. Move from where you are and enter in the realm of the Spirit. Come on and live. Come on and connect to the power source. Come on and connect to the Holy Ghost. Come and live. You shall not die physically or spiritually, but you will live to declare the glory of God. No weapon formed against you shall prosper now. No, no, all is well, all is well, for we know who we believe in, and we are persuaded that God is able to keep that which is committed unto him. It may look and feel unbearable. You may be asking God this morning, why and how long? But remember that God is too wise to be mistaken and too good to be unkind. If God brought you to it, he will bring you out of it. And if you made a wrong turn and got there, he's still a deliverer. He's a God of deliverances. He will bring you out. He will bring you out. He will rescue you. He is a faithful God. God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Have you given it all to the Lord? Have you given it all to the Lord? Have you given it all to the Lord? Is your faith in God? Is your faith renewed? Glory be to God. Sit in the presence of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Abraham believed the word. He believed the word of God. And it came to pass at the appointed. This morning I'm directed to speak to you on the topic. There's a need for godly fathers in the home and in the church. My text comes from Proverbs 17, 6. Grandchildren are the crown of the age. And the glory of children is their fathers. Priority of creation gave Adam headship. This means that God created the man first and gave him the responsibility of head of his household, which entailed leading his family in righteous living before God in all that they did and said. From this we can deduce that fathers, especially Christian fathers are to teach their child or children how to live morally in society, to exhibit good manners in their behavior, and to walk upright before the Lord. Genesis 18, 19 tells us that the sole reason why God chose Abraham not only to be the biological father of his children, but to be the spiritual father 
of the Jewish nation and the entire world is because God says he will command his own soul. He will teach them the word of God and he will see to it that they obey God and do what is right. The Old Testament and the New Testament holds the father responsible for his children's walk with God because he is the priest of his family and is accountable to God for his family's spiritual development and enrichment. As a Christian father, you can't put the responsibility on the Sunday school teacher. You can't put the responsibility on the school. It is your responsibility. Yes. Therefore, the father has the greatest responsibility in the home to raise his children in righteousness before the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 7 to 9 says, You shall teach the words that I have commanded you diligently to your children and you shall talk to them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way when you lie down when you rise up you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and there shall be a frontlet between your eyes you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gifts god is talking to fathers about what they should do pertaining to their children instead of putting them in the 21st century on the tablet on the ipod and the cell phone he says you should talk to them when you sit in your house you should talk to them about the lord when you're walking the way or driving when you lie down and when you rise up you are to tell your children about the Lord and what God requires and what God expects. This is confirmed by King Solomon, a descendant of Abraham, who said to his children in Proverbs 4, chapter 4, verses 3 to 5, he said, when I was a young boy in my father's house, my father said to me, hold on to my words with all your heart, keep my commands and you will live. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Solomon is speaking about what his father King David taught him from a young child. As well as his father's emphasis of the importance of obeying every command Jehovah handed down to Israel. If he wanted to live a long, blessed and successful life naturally and spiritually. Solomon's instruction to his children reveals that despite the passing of time, the words of his deceased father, that his deceased father has spoken, were permanently inscribed on his heart. It also revealed that similar to his father David, Solomon fulfilled the covenant obligation of fathers that is recorded in the scripture I just read in Deuteronomy chapter 6. To pass on the scriptures and godly principles to the next generation. Ephesians 6 4 says, Fathers, train and teach your children the ways of the Lord as you raise them. It is the Father's responsibility. As long as you're in the home, you have more opportunities to do it. But if you are no longer in the home and you are a Christian father, it is expected of every father. But as long as you are a Christian father, you have to find the time to talk to your children about God. We find the time to take them to the park in the summer, to run around and get on the seesaws and the swings. We find the time to take them to McDonald's. Well, while they're there, eat and tell them something about God. Because it is what you put in your children's life that will shape them to be good men and women of God. Amen. Whether a child acknowledges it or realizes it, he or she often mimics his fathers or the one who raised him at Zambushi. This is the number one reason why the Lord made the home the primary and most ideal place for biblical instruction by fathers. Because the greatest spiritual education your children will receive in their lifetime is not what comes through the school system or in some churches, but what comes through the home by way of the father's teaching, instructions, and examples. 
You can't depend upon another person to do your job. The key role of the father will always be to teach his children the word of God and Christian values. Today every religion is taught in the educational system except Christ and holiness and in some churches idolatry and carnality is exemplified. And so what your children are not getting in high school or middle school in college or university, you've got to start putting it in them now. You've got to find the time to teach them the word of God. Get your sanctified hands and a clean anointed dedicated bottle of oil and smear the oil on your children and prayer prayers in their ears that will go into their spirits that they will remember when the tempter comes. You see, science have developed chips that if you put it in your body, you can be found just like vehicles have GPS and stuff like that. But nobody has developed anything to protect your children from spiritual danger. If they're abducted, if they're lost in a mountain, if they went hiking, something, some satellite will pick up something. Uh, but when the Mormon comes, uh, when the Scientologist comes, uh, when the Satanists come, uh, there's no chip, no alarm that goes off to say, run, run, this is not of God. But when you teach your children the word of God, uh, when you help them to understand uh, what God requires from them, uh, when you see to it uh, that they make a personal commitment uh, to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, when the devil comes, uh, the alarm of the Holy Ghost goes off saying uh, that is not me uh, that is not my word uh, don't listen to that uh, and will cause your children to flee from the entrapment of the enemy, you've got to do it fathers, uh, you've got to do it parents uh, you've got to do it men of God uh, if you love your children you've got to make sure that they're spiritually safe uh, not only in college and university uh, but when they travel and they move abroad to live uh, outside of America or to another state uh, you've got to make sure that your children can survive uh, the onslaught of idolatry that is released in the earth today uh, it's on the job uh, it's in the neighborhood uh, wherever you go the enemy is wreaking havoc Proverbs 23, 24 says, The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who has a wise child will delight in him. The scriptures make known that fatherhood is a great responsibility and a very high calling from God. Hence, the manual for Christian fatherhood is the Bible, and in it, God is a perfect role model as a father. Yeah. You know, in, in getting the opportunity to read some of the, the genesis of the, the, the religious history of America, everything was founded on the word of God because the founding fathers were steep in the word of God, and they prayed and they sought God when they were crafting the constitution. And now uh, we have come to a time where they don't want you to refer to God for anything. Uh, they're trying to say that the Bible is outdated. But the, but the word of God tells us uh, that in the scriptures are the words of life. Uh, if you want children that will do right. Uh, if you want children that will grow up uh, and be a blessing to this country. You've got to start giving them the word. Uh, I, I see uh, our children are school in Peppa Pig. Uh, and their school or uh, the, the, what they're calling those little cats or dogs uh, that run to the rescue you know in the cartoons their school and all of that uh, but when it comes to the word of God they don't know the word of God uh, our children need to know that God is a deliverer they need to know the story of David and Goliath uh, they need to know the story of Joseph uh, and the coat of many colors uh, they need to know the story of Daniel and Elijah then, uh, and the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace uh, they need to know the story and the Moses uh, and the rod of God that wrought miracles uh, 
that need to know the story of Jesus. Five barley loaves and two small fish. They need to know that Jesus turned water into wine. They need to know that the God that we serve is a miracle working God. They are enjoying fiction when the reality of miracles any superman there is is Jesus. Any superhero there is it is Jesus, uh, for he can fly with or without wings. Uh, he speaks a word. The Bible says uh, that the planets are upheld uh, by the word of his power. I came over the Brooklyn Bridge this morning, uh, and if there weren't supports holding that bridge up, uh, I would not have been able to cross. Uh, but the planet Earth, nothing is holding it up. Uh, Jesus said, stay there and don't move. Uh, and just go around, around, around uh, our church children need to know who God is Amen. and the power of the miracles of God. Amen. Amen. The word of God highlights several exemplary men who were great biological and spiritual fathers to their children or just a spirit father, spiritual father to a protege or successor. The Bible tells us about Noah and Abraham and Job who were biological and spiritual fathers to their children. Elijah was Elisha's spiritual father. He passed the mantle to him. The apostle Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy, Titus, and Onesimus. Peter was a spiritual father to John Mark. The greatest responsibility a father has is to be a man of God for his children. There will be no greater fulfillment in life than to know that the example you gave your children will lead them to Christ and also teach them how to handle the difficulties of life. Lullius the Roman poet says, it has been said that a child is not likely to find a father in God unless he finds something of God in his father. Did you hear that? Because we are the Jesuses that people see. And if your children see God in you, they will want to serve the God that you serve. They might rebel for some point in time, but they're watching, they're looking for consistency. My God, have mercy in Zion. I know the challenge as a mother, but my thing is at the end of the day, even if I am gone, that the child that God gave me would say, my mother served God from the beginning to the end. She kept the faith. She believed in God and that he too will hold on to God. Because of the increase of single family homes, there's a great need for spiritual fathers in the home and in the church to help Generation X, Millennials, Gen Z, and Gen Alpha generations come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to serve him. We are living in an era now where every generation is given a title. And every title means a different level of demonic assignment. My God of mercy. I am not a generation this or a generation that. But I belong to God. I am a Christian. Yes, the Bible does mention the generations in the sense that generations comes and go. But it's not a stigma. Nowadays, generation this carries stigma generation um, Gen Z generation and the children of Gen Z are called Gen Alpha the stigma is uh, they don't want God they don't want to live holy they want God to rewrite the scriptures they want God to agree uh, to their abominable lifestyle uh, but when you as a father take a stand uh, hallelujah whatever your child wants to do doesn't mean you don't love them that child anymore but when you take a stand as a Christian father and you say to your child Lord children I love you and I will always love you and I will always be your father but in this thing I will not support it because the God who blessed me with you did not intend for you to be like this Amen. Amen. there are some fundamental parenting principles Fathers can learn from Job as a biological and, and as a spiritual father. The profound statement in Job 1 3 about Job being the, the greatest man among all the people of the East indicates the character and the quality of his spiritual life. 
In other words, Job's reputation of being blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil, contributed to him being recognized as the greatest man among all the people of the East. Such a reputation takes years to build and takes character to make and maintain. This kind of father has great influence over his children. You are not responsible for the decision that your adult children make. But at least when they look at you, they can see that you are a man of God. They know what you stand for. Spiritual father within the confines of his home and before his family, Job demonstrated genuine devotion to, to the true and living God as he raised his children. In other words, Job lived as a virtuous man of God before his children. Even though the toughest job in all the world is parenting, as a responsible father, Job was always aware of his adult children activities. He knew precisely where they were and what they were doing even when he was not invited. He was not a naive or disinterested parent. He kept a very close eye on his grown children without intruding in their affairs. Job was not a busybody, but he certainly uh, didn't close his eyes. He understood his responsibility. The problem with us in the 21st century is that when our children get 18, uh, we lose them to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, but that is not how it is to be. Yes, there will be adults. Yes, they will want to live on their own. Uh, but you still have the responsibility as a spiritual parent uh, to make sure that what your children are doing is right. And if you can't stop it by your verbal hallelujah counselor, you've got something in prayer that will do anything at all. As a father in your home and a spiritual father in the church, you must always be aware and discerning of your own children and those you watch over in the church pertaining to any change in their character or behavior. If you love your children, and if you love the children of them, you've got to keep an eye on them. You've got to watch them in the eyes of the spirit to see when there's change. A father fails when he literally believes that his child will never do anything wrong. There are some children who use their parents' naivety to their advantage to be disobedient or to commit sin and get away from it repeatedly. It's a foolish thing to think that you are raising the good angels that are in heaven. Man was born in sin and shaping iniquity. You've got to wake up fathers. You've got to wake up parents and understand that your child, as nice as he or she is, as obedient as he or she may be, will do something wrong. And you've got to be willing to accept that, investigate it, and do something about it. Because if you don't, when it is thus revealed to you, is when it is too far gone. That is when it takes prayer and fasting. That's when it takes God to come in as a mighty man of war and to deliver your children from what they're going through. I see it happening all the time. There are times now that my son is grown that he will say to me, Mommy, you know you told me that I shouldn't take to school such and such. I said, yes, he said, I did. I could not believe that he would disobey me in spite of how strict I was. I was a spiritual police. Everything had to be as God said it would be. But he still find the time to disobey and take it to school and come back. And I didn't know. You cannot be that naive. You must watch your children in the eyes of the spirit. You must be praying and seeking God to reveal to you things about your children that you don't know. Because things you don't permit in the home, they're doing at school and they're acting the part like they're right. But in the meantime, corruption has taken place on the inside and you've got to inquire 
of God. The name Job comes from an ancient word that means raised father. Job was an answer to that. Job chapter 1 verses 4 to 5 reveals that Job was right there for his children day and night because he cared about their spiritual well-being and consistent walk with God. Job knew he had received a treasure from God and that he was called to raise them in holiness and as an upright father role model to his children, Job stood before God daily with the weighty responsibility of parenting both naturally and spiritually. That's why Job was chiefly concerned about his children's spiritual welfare and the extent to which they were glorified and honor God in all that they did and enjoyed even when they were feasting privately. Job didn't take it for granted. The scripture says, his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send for them, and Job would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Thus Job did regularly. I want you to know that these were married men that Job was sending for. These were adult daughters that Job was sending for. And of course, when the sons came, the wives came. And Job was sent for them and ministered to them spiritually. This is evidence that Job's priority was the genuine continuity of his children's walk with God and the security of their salvation. And that Job had a sincere concern for his children to maintain their personal decision to embrace God just as he did and to serve God wholeheartedly. You see, because Job lived a life before his children as a man of God when daddy called the children came. They understood that whatever feast they're having after the feast was over, we've got to go to daddy because daddy isn't going to rest until he's absolutely sure that our lives are still right with God. Every Christian biological and spiritual father must have the same kind of accountability Job had before God for his children's consistent spirituality as well as a great concern for his children and the children in the church spiritual maturity and devotion to God. The Apostle Paul showed great concern for Timothy's spiritual growth and well-being in providing guidance and mentorship to him, particularly in the area of dealing with false teachings and maintaining doctrinal and spiritual integrity. You've got to do it. You've got to live the life. I know that the generations now are different from in Job's time. I know that. But you've got to live the life that when you do that, that Zoom call, and all of them are there, you say, I understand that you were partying. I know you're going to say, Daddy, I did it. didn't do anything wrong, but I've got to pray for you. And once they respect you, they will bow their heads and allow you to pray prayers over their lives uh, that will see to it uh, that the devil doesn't steal, kill, and to destroy their lives. Amen. In 2024, it has become very difficult for pastors and spiritual fathers in genuine Christian churches to fulfill God's expectation of them to instruct the church's children in righteousness by speaking to them about their own Christian behavior because of the serious repercussions or backlash by some parents. But I want to say to you today, spiritual fathers, where you lack a voice and permission in the church to oversee the next generation from the Lord and for the Lord, you have on your knees before God. It's a reality in churches everywhere. Christian parents, uh, the deacon, the deaconess, the elder, the evangelist, uh, the minister does not want you uh, to have uh, any, any corrective uh, um, permission pertaining to their children. And so you have children in the church that are disrespectful. I was at a church quite recently and there was this 
little girl sitting up front with her red lip gloss and her mirror out and she's putting on the lip gloss in church and I sat there and I look at her and I just shake my head then there's another one with a short dress and she's sitting down like the Buddha and I looked at her and I told her to put down her feet you shall see how those two little children cut up their eyes at me, how they carry on, and how they were talking to young people, God, like if I was the worst person on planet Earth, in the church, in the church, not on the train, not at McDonald's, in the church, and why is this so? Because fathers and mothers are not allowing the church to do what God has put the pastors and leaders in church to do but then when these children get out of hand and they're sitting in a jail cell or in some correction institution then you are praying fasting and then you are this way you are the cause of it children who our members of the church of Jesus Christ should be the best children in school. Yes, a mistake may happen here and there, but we should not be called. I remember as a parent, my son bringing home a report saying, he, he's, he's, he's like the class clown, he's giggling in, in school. Or oh, he had a reprimand, and he never did that again. Because I said, if another one comes, I am coming, and when I come, you know what is going to be. You've got to be very stern. You can't allow the enemy to have the upper hand in the lives of your children, my God. Second Timothy 1, 3 makes known that the Apostle Paul prayed for his spiritual son regularly. He said, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers day and night. Fathers, you've got to pray for your children. You've got a responsibility in this church to pray for the young children you see in the church. If you can't talk to them, if you can't correct them, children are gifts given by God. They belong to God. He's the God of all flesh and the God of the spirits of men. Pray before God and call their names. Tell God, change Johnny. Tell God, change Joanna. Tell God to speak to the hearts of their parents that they will do right by their children. I know sometimes because the younger mothers are rebellion that the grandchildren behave as the mothers want them to be but at least when they are with you they need to know how to respect you and how to conduct themselves don't compromise don't accept bad behavior do something about it now more than ever before, there's a great need for spiritual fathers in the home and in the church to guide the young generations uh, towards God and away from backsliding, uh, from mental health issues, suicide, crime and prison. It is because uh, our children are turning away from God that the devil is messing with their minds uh, through the games that they're playing and the movies uh, that they're watching and demons and devils are tormenting God but fathers it is your responsibility I know that men boast that the man was created uh, first uh, it is not a privileged position uh, it's a position of responsibility God created you first uh, and gave you headship over the home and over your children you are to command them uh, in righteousness uh, you are to declare the whole counsel of God to your children and I'm being realistic here I know that there's some children that have become so grown and disrespectful that when you call they wouldn't come and if they pick up the phone they will say dad mom I don't want to hear that's quite alright you have prayer you have an altar you tell it to Jesus you call their names you bind and rebuke demons and devils you decree and declare my children will serve God my children will come out of darkness into God's marvelous light. It is not a lost cause. The word of God shows that Job took his responsibility of being a biological father and spiritual father and a priest of his children seriously. 
Job chapter 1 verses 4 to 5 makes known that Job was very concerned that his righteous children might have sinned against God when they were feasting and became filled with wine. He said Job would say in his heart every time his children had a party, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, said Job. Notice that the daughters are also feasting, but Job is putting the responsibility on the sons because he understands the, 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 what the man was created to do and he was sent for the sons not that he didn't do it for the daughter the Bible was primarily written in a man's world but he was sent for his children but Job wanted to make sure that his sons were right with God because they were the head of the household and whoever his daughters married that man would come in as a man of God and he would be the head of the household so he understood that his daughters would eventually get a man of God to do for them what his sons were supposed to do or was doing in their household. Job knew that there were temptations to sin, even in legitimate godly pleasure. Satan entered Edom and all was well. And when he left, Edom was not the same. As a matter of fact, when Satan left, that was the end of Eden altogether. Fathers, now more than ever, there's a great need for spiritual fathers in the home and in the church to guide the young generations towards God and away from the Illuminati. If you don't teach your children contentment, if you don't teach them to pray and to trust God and to believe God to provide, the Illuminati is offering quick money, millionaire status in a day. Whatever you want, the devil is giving you Why? He's after the soul for what shall it profit? A man to gain the whole world and lose the soul. But when we teach our children about how God God bless Job and how God bless Abraham and his descendants, how God has blessed King David and how God bless Joseph, how God bless Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in Babylon, how God bless Esther and Mordecai in Persia. God is still making millionaires out of men and women. When we do our part, our children will believe God for clean prosperity, holy prosperity. They're millionaires, but the demons are tormenting them and they're suicidal and they're losing their minds. Why? They have money but no joy. They have a fleet of cards and no peace. They have the best things to wear and no excitement. They're they can fly all over the world privately and there is no happiness. Glory to God. You should see me on the bus with my earpiece in and I'm saying I'm smiling. Why? I've got a joy unspeakable and full of glory. You should see me on the train just excited about God. I see people watching me and I could tell they know that I'm a Christian because of the expression. We've got the real McCoy. We've got the real deal. But when we leave this earth, like the songwriter said, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we never grow old. And someday longer, we will no more walk them but walk on streets of pure stone. We've got to tell them about heaven, about gates of pearls and streets of gold. The Bible is not fiction. It is reality. We've got to see to it that our children are not greedy and gluttonous for fame and money that will sell their souls to the devil. Job was not the kind of father that helped his children to sin or wink and sin as Eli did. How does a father help his children to sin? Firstly, by not being a Christian role model before them in his character and deeds. He says one thing and does another. Secondly, by not correcting them when they are wrong because he loves his children so much that he doesn't want to offend them or hurt them by chastising them. When a father does this, he's not mimicking God. He's raising his child or children 
as if they were bastards. Uh, Hebrews 12, 6, 9 says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastises and scourges every son whom he receives. Uh, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. Uh, for what son is there whom a father does not chastise? Uh, but if you are without chastisement of which all you have become partakers, then you are bastards and uh, not sons. Hmm? You tell people, this is my son, this is my daughter. Be open bank account and we start putting down $10 a month because this is my son and this is my daughter. They bear your surname, they bear your image, but then you raise them as bastards. Do you understand what a bastard was? Way, way, way back then, bastards were children of prostitutes. They had no fathers that roamed the streets and begged for this and that. Had no education. Nasty and dirty. Torn clothes. Oversized clothes. And when you look at them, you say, look at those bastards. Daughters, are you raising godly children or are you raising bad bastards? Thirdly, fathers help their children to sin by either buying or giving them the money to purchase shameful clothing. Or electronic devices that are so addictive that they need psychotherapy and deliverance by the power of God to be restored to mental, emotional, and spiritual holiness. Uh, there are some people who wear the collar and they're still rebelling against the holiness movement in 1942. And they give their children money to go and buy a brassiere and the pants to wear on the street. And they don't see anything wrong with it. All these rip up jeans. I remember children crying when I was growing up because that was all they had to wear. And you were going to pay all that money for clothes that is ripped up. Not understand it's a spirit that you're bringing into your life. Anybody here grow up poor beside me? They will give their children money to buy disgraceful clothes and to buy all kinds of electronics that keep them away from reading the Bible. The Bible is downloaded, but they're not using it. They bring them to church and they either sit in church or sit to the back and they're on the device. They're not hearing the word. They're not interested. I remember when my son asked me for cable television. I knew if I did that, it would be the wrongest thing. One day he got so fed up, he said, man, I like I would be an old man with gray hair before you put in cable. Huh? Because I cared about his spiritual well-being. I cared about his academic well-being. Huh? Now more than ever before, there's a great need for spiritual fathers in the home and in the church to guide the young generation towards God and away from the entrapments of the kingdom of darkness. I was upstairs at the church recently and I saw two young boys between the age of 1911 in church doing hip hop dance. So I went over, I said, um, is this something you've learned from the dance ministry in the church to, to perform? Hmm? We are serving a generation that has not been taught to fear God and to respect the house of God. They're coming like, I have no other choice. My body is present, but the rest of me is where I want to be. Job's actions prove that he did not only talk to his children about fearing God and honoring God in their deeds by shunning the appearance of sin and living holy. He did something to ensure their spiritual purity. The Bible says after their feasted, he was sent for them and sanctified them. This proves that Job faithfully bore his responsibility as a spiritual leader of his family as he oversaw his children and interceded for them, ensuring that each one under his influence remained pure in heart before the Lord. It must be understood that in the patriarchal period, Job was acting as a priest in representing his children before God in offering sacrifices for sin. Job sacrificed for sin, made his children holy before God. Job did not have the power to make his children holy. Only God could through the blood sacrifice Job offered up to them. He made sure 
He made sure that they were clean and they always had access to God. Sanctification for your children under the new covenant is through the blood of Jesus Christ and the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Living a sanctified life is to live a life that pleases God and brings glory to him. It's the outward expression of the inward salvation that one has received by faith in the substitutionary work of Christ as the sacrificial lamb that takes away the sins of the world. A sanctified life is indispensable for the believer. If he wants a life of closeness to the presence of God and growing in the anointed, it is important to know that Job's ritual caused his children to see the need for separation from sin and devotion to God. Every time Job would call his son, they saw the need to live right. It wasn't a one-time thing or annual thing. Whenever they feasted, they saw the need for separation from sin and devotion to God. No more than ever, there's a great need for spiritual fathers in the home and in the church to guide the young generations towards God and away from the enticing sins of the world. Fathers, your children must see the need for separation from the world if they're going to grow in God and make it into heaven. When your children come home and they tell you they want to spend their, the weekend at their best friend's house, but their best friend is on sale, and the parents smoke and drink, and you let them go. Huh? They don't see the need for the separation from sin. You let them go into somebody's house and sleep in somebody's bed. They're reek with demonic spirits. What do you think is coming back to you? Hmm? Some people think you're making up stuff. I remember staying in a hotel. And no sooner than I got in the bed, the attack came. I had to get up a warn the noise. People need spirit, spirits yeah. everywhere. Your children need to see the need for separation from the world. How can you have a best friend that is unsafe? How can you want to go to best friend house when they come to you and they tell you that they've been invited to a party? You've got to know who's keeping the party. Yeah. All of this secular music and whining and jamming, you know, and the pressure of people, come on, a little dancing won't hurt you. I'm sure your mommy wouldn't want you to be a party pooper. No, no, no. You've got to cause your children to see the need for separation from sin. And sometimes you use strategy. You can't go to the party, but you take them someplace that is even more delightful. A sanctifying practice Job performed with respect to his children had the effect of destroying the power of sin in their lives because God blessed Job's effort with holiness. God blessed it. God blessed it. When the Lord allowed an enemy to take his sons and daughters out, they didn't die unsaved because Job kept up the ritual. He kept up the practice and his children have grown to know I need to separate myself from wickedness. If we are going to drink wine, just enough. But we are not going to get drunk and curse God and don't know it. That's why we are commanded and we must expect it of our children that they present their bodies, their minds, conscious, subconscious, and unconscious as living sacrifices unto God. We must demand holiness and righteousness. God uses our efforts and prayers to bless our children with the grace to live holy. No more than ever before there's a great need for spiritual fathers in the home and in the church to guide the young generations towards God and away from the false righteousness of the world. You have people saying God accepts me as I am. No he doesn't. That's why there's Calvary. God accepts you as redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and pursuing to be conformed to his image in the earth. Fathers, in closing, 
God is depending on you to take your responsibility as a biological and spiritual father seriously. He wants you to live a holy life before your children, whether they are dependent or have families of their own. He wants your presence to be an epistle read of men to the children of the church. When you walk through this church, every man, whether you are a biological father, you are a spiritual father. And as you maneuver in this church, whenever the children see you, they must see a spiritual father. Someone who has the divine authority to speak correction into their lives. He wants you to be a joke to your children and grandfather. Hallelujah. Covering them in your prayers that would ward off seducing spirits, spiritual deception, and demonic encroachment. I want every father to stand with me. Every spiritual father, every man in this building, every man in this building, even Sister Barbara's son, every man in this building, Hagar. Father, I thank you. Some of you may not desire children, or may not think that marriage is on the table for you. But if you're not a biological father, God is expecting you to be a spiritual father in this house. And to the criteria to be a spiritual father is to live the life that the young generation will see God in you. That when you walk up to Thomas and you walk up to Jane and you say, don't do that. Don't shout, don't scream, put away that. This is the house of God. That they will obey you because they can see God in you and hear God speaking through you. Father, today I lift the fathers of this church to you. Every father, God, I present to you today in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And I ask you, Father, to anoint them to be the kind of father you are. And the kind of father that you made Job to be. It was not by Job's doing, but because Job embraced you, you gave Job the grace and the ability to be the kind of father he was to his children. I pray, God, that as they listen to this word, that there will purpose in their heart today, that as fathers and grandfathers and possible grandfathers, that I will take charge of my children's life. Some of you have children in their 40s and 50s. Hallelujah, 60s, you are still a father. That is still your son and daughter. You have grandchildren in their 20s and 30s. My God of mercy, every parent today, it is our responsibility as Christians to see to it that our children know about God, that our children know that we are people of God. Father, give them the grace. Give them the grace to correct anything in their lives that they're not doing right. Give them the grace, the courage, and the faith to be the men of God that you have called them to be in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that parents today would not love their children as bastards. They wouldn't love them that much that they allow them to live disobedient lives. But they will love their children as you love us. Anytime we are about to do something wrong, here comes the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Because God is a good father. And I pray today that every father under the sound of my voice in this sanctuary and online that you will make a covenant promise with God today. That you will see to it that your children are not bastards. That you will speak to them in the error of their ways. That they will become good, good, good men and women and citizens of the world. Help us, Father, as Christian parents in the house of God to allow the leadership to do the work that they're called to do in helping us raise good children in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us not take it personal, but let us allow the spirit of grace to raise our children that will be happy and blessed for foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Help us, God. Anoint your men today. Anoint your fathers. 
Bless them with wisdom. Bless them with courage. And Father, give them who may not have the opportunity and open doors. Give them access, mighty God, into the lives of their sons and daughters that they may be able to speak a word in season. Father, give them favor. Give them grace and help their lives to shine. I commit every father to you in this sanctuary, save and unsave. I commit every grandfather to you. I commit every young man to you. Every single man to you. Every man comes into the earth with a responsibility to be the head of his household. And whatever age that position comes, I pray God that he will be ready even to be a father to trust that are not his a stepfather, a spiritual father, mighty God, in the name of Jesus, a caregiver, whatever capacity of father, hallelujah, that he may come under God, that you would help him today to be the God kind of father. I commit you spirit, soul, and body into the hands of God Almighty. And I thank God for anointing you to be one of the best fathers living on planet earth uh, in this church uh, and in america and wherever you go i pray that children will be drawn to you because of the love of god the goodness of god and the heart of god that you've received today extensively to be a good father father you are the father from whom fatherhood is derived put your heart as a father in the heart of every man in this building today and online. Put your heart in their heart to be great fathers to their children. And I call it done. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.